This is Vincent Xavier, pastor of New Wine Ministries. Great to be with you on this Friday. We're going to have a wonderful time today. We have a very special guest, Dr. Brock Hall. It's going to be joining me in just a moment on the air. But I just want to remind everybody today that on Wednesday at the setting of the sun, we will be hosting the great feast of Passover. Wednesday evening, Passover begins. We're going to have a great time. We'll give you all the information as we go forward. And again, good Friday morning to everybody. What a strange world we live in. There's no doubt about it. President Donald J. Trump has been indicted. We're going to find out what that means. We have a weekend of rage coming up in Washington, D.C. We have families that have been devastated by unfortunate events going on in our country and around the world. But one of the primary uh, focuses that we should all have as believers in Jesus Christ, followers of of our Father in Heaven is what is going on with Israel, what is going on in the Middle East. To help us walk through that today is our dear friend, Brock Hollett. He is a doctor, and he's a board-certified physician and psychiatrist. Ouch, get ready, pull out the couch, let's go. Uh, Dr. Hollett earned a Bachelor of Science in Middle School Education from the University of Central Missouri, just north of us here in 2000, and a Master of Divinity from Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in 2003. He worked toward a PhD in Religious Studies at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, from 2003 to 2004. We were just there the other day, Patricia and I. He worked three years as a social worker for adults with developmental disabilities before becoming an osteopathic physician, earning his medical degree from Kansas City University in 2014. He completed his psychiatry residency at Centerstone of Florida in Bradenton, Florida. I had a tennis tournament there, by the way. I love that place. In 2018, from so from 2015 to 2020, he served as an adjunct professor of science and biblical studies at Southeastern University in Bradenton, Florida. He received his board certification from the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology in 2020, and he currently practices psychiatry in Sarasota, Florida. That's impossible. We were just there. We go there every year. Didn't know that Dr. Hollett was there. So Dr. Hollett's theological interests include the Holy Church Fathers, eschatology, soteriology, and sacramental theology. He previously authored Debunking Preterism, How Over-Realized Eschatology Misses the Not Yet of Biblical Prophecy. He wrote that in 2018. And Moshiach Now in 2020. He and his wife, Stacy have four daughters. They attend St. Joseph Orthodox Church in Sarasota, Florida. It was back in 2018 and 2019 that Dr. Brock Hollick joined us on Kerm Radio for a number of interviews, which were phenomenal. I want to, without further delay, bring him onto the broadcast. Welcome, Dr. Brock Hollett. How are you today, sir? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me, Pastor. Well, you know, I'm shocked as I'm just kind of reading through what you have done in your work and part of who you are. Sarasota is one of our favorite spots. We're going there every year. We were just there a couple of weeks ago, and um, we love Armand Circle and all the great stuff there. And uh, we were probably uh, walking by each other one day. Who knows, right? True. Amen. Dr. Brock, you just wrote a, another book. I believe this is your third. Uh, why don't you say hello to everybody out there in um, podcast land and in the world of radio and internet and uh, just greet everyone and let's get on with an interview. Sounds good. Well, thank you for having me, of course, on the show again. Uh, as always, it's a it's a blessing to me and I trust and hope that it will be for the for the audience as well. But Thank you again. Absolutely. Um, let's talk about your book immediately. Uh, give us the title of the book, the name of the book, uh, the purpose behind it. And uh, obviously, this is dealing with Israel, the Middle East, and what's going on at this time in that area of the world. So the book is called Jesus, the Jews, and the End of the Age, the subtitle, What the Bible Predicts About the End Times. And the book is really a synthesis of everything that the Bible talks about regarding the end times. So, as you might expect, some of the main themes that surface are found in the title, right? Of course, Christ being the centerfold of, of the whole uh, eschatological plan of God, the Jews playing a pivotal role in that plan, and the end of the age, of course, being the time in which uh, we are speaking. So, one of the goals of the book is to uh, include every end-time prophecy, uh, and, and, it, and it virtually does that. And so it's it's a little bit larger book. It's six by nine, so it's it's uh, four hundred and three pages. So it is a little dense, but it's it's really written 
for a large audience. So it's written for any Christian who likes, who, who can read and who enjoys uh, learning about Bible prophecy and what God has in plan for us and for the world and for Israel. Uh, this is really a book for you. Uh, my first two books were for a smaller niche of, of people, but this one is clearly for, for all Christians. And I think it's um, very pertinent for the times in which we live, because I think we see from the world around us that the time is uh, increasingly short uh, before our Lord's return. So um, I would, you know, it, it comes in both a hardback and an ebook. Of course, you can find it on Amazon and, and several places uh, on the web. All right. Very, very good. So let's get into the meat of the book. Uh, 403 pages. Um, that's a lot of work. Uh, that's a lot of work for everything else you do to have authored this book. And the way that you wrote your first book that I knew about, which was Debunking Preterism, was absolutely phenomenal. It was written uh, with skill. There's no doubt about it. And it really it assisted a lot of people that were being somewhat assaulted by the preterist view that was being uh, you know, increasingly spoken about in these days of people wondering about everything, which is good. It was a very good conversation uh, as people were just looking for the truth. So let's get into the meat of Jesus, the Jews, and the end times. Um, we, I guess the most important thing is recently we have seen that in Israel there have been some major protests. Do you write about this in your book? Is that something we could dive into and kind of get an understanding of what's happening there? So a couple things. Uh, just for clarity, it's it's Jesus, the Jews, and the end of the age. Just in case you're looking it up, I um, uh, I want to make sure you get to the right place. But um, so the book primarily is exegetical. So it's it goes into the scriptures and what the scriptures teach. I do uh, have some uh, speculative thoughts about how that relates to the times in which we live. I do make some passing comments. Thank you so much. I do make some passing comments about. Uh, how I believe it relates to modern events, some of which are very clear and evident, and others of which are uh, highly likely. Um, there were so many times in writing the book, I was tempted to go down so many rabbit trails about what I really think and this, that, and the other. Um, but one of the things I attempted to do in the book is when I was real clear about it is to make it clear and say, this is, this is uh, more than probable, this is, this is uh, the case. And when those th current events are likely uh, corresponding to what we expect in Holy Scripture, then I would I would speak of that in that direction as well. So, yes, in fact, uh, at one point I talk about how some of the current geopolitical events that we're experiencing with on an international scale are exactly what we would expect to happen right before uh, the final years um, uh, leading up to and including the tribulation and, of course, uh, the Lord's return thereafter. Amen. So you and I, neither one of us are ashamed to admit that the potential for all of Bible prophecy being fulfilled before our very eyes today is there. We believe that. We're looking at the signs of the times. We're seeing it maybe from different directions, but we're all witnessing something going on in this world that's giving us you know, uh, a heads up. Hey, pay attention right now. There's a lot going on. And so if, when we stand back and we take a look at the, the world events and we take a worldview through biblical lens, you are showing through the word of God that these events that are going on in the world are relevant to the times that we're living in right now. What are some of the things that you are writing about, you are seeing that believers should be aware of and say, wow, this is a sign that we need to pay attention to. What are some of those signs? Certainly. I think that one of the more important signs that is often overlooked and shouldn't be, but unfortunately is, is the return of the Jewish people back to the land in the 20th in the mid 20th century. I think that's huge. Not that there hasn't been some Jews throughout the land off and on throughout the millennia there have, uh, but we see a wholesale return of the Jews to the land, which is a necessary precursor to some of the major prophecies of scripture, not the least of which is that this nation will be involved with uh, being in a position of uh, supposed peace and security that is um, really an illusion of, of the truth. Uh, and also the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem, which the Jews will do as an attempt to uh, establish their sacrificial system and submit to the law of Moses again, uh, which should, should get our attention. Um, you know, it talks about how this northern aggressor from Israel will take away the daily sacrifice in the Jerusalem temple and will set up uh, an idol of abomination in that temple 
Uh, in order for that to happen, there has to at least be the beginnings of a temple. And that means there has to be a large Jewish presence in the land. Um, in order for this northern aggressor to come down into the land, like it says in Ezekiel, at the end of Ezekiel's prophecies, we also have to have uh, a Jewish people in the land. And we have to uh, obviously have the events of 1967, which is that Jerusalem would be captured by the Jews and again become uh, the quintessential capital of the, of the people. Uh, we also are, are seeing things in more recent times. For example, whether or not the Abraham Accords that uh, President Donald Trump uh, began and is uh, continuing under President Biden, whether or not that is uh, a direct fulfillment of biblical prophecy is um, certainly debatable. But one thing that is abundantly clear is that we expect that this final aggressor and the International League of Nations will enter into a supposed peace treaty, international, presumably international peace treaty, with Israel, which will either guarantee the Jewish right to the holy place and their sacrificial system, or it will, it will open up the door for Israel to presume that they have the right to do that, one way or the other. But nonetheless, uh, these events are exactly what we would expect. We also would expect a southern coalition around the south of Israel, including such nations perhaps as Saudi Arabia and Egypt and um, the OAE and so forth, to be in league uh, with each other, which is something, strangely enough, no one would have ever predicted five years ago uh, in the general population of the United States, but yet that's exactly what we've seen in the last few years. And also a northern coalition that we already see forming with such nations as Turkey and um, as strange bedfellow as Iran, who historically as a Shia nation has not been, you know, in, in good relations with the Sunni nations is, is nonetheless in prophecy supposed to make uh, a coalition with them. So we're seeing a lot of these developments. And so we should expect a few more as well as the days approach. Amen. So the developments, we see them all over the world. Um, you know, one of the questions I have in my mind uh, as we're diving into this, you know, concerning you, maybe people are asking, you know, how did you get into this kind of thinking, this kind of writing? You know, what led you to, um, you know, move into uh, Bible prophecy, looking at Jesus and his, his discussion to us, his, his instructions to us, um, looking what's going on in the Middle East? You know, you know, how did you get diverted into that? How did your attention move in the direction so that right now we could be listening to uh, your insights as the Holy Spirit led you into this conversation? How did you get into this? Even as a young child, I was interested in uh, Jesus and the church and what, uh, you know, the gospel, but also about what's going to happen in the future. For some reason, that's always been an interest of mine, even from the youngest of ages. And uh, as time went on, of course, my understanding of those things has developed and changed and even been corrected on several points over the years. Um, I think for me, uh, the, the longer I've been a Christian, the more I sense that eschatology forms a bedrock of the gospel itself. You know, not just the, the main and plain things such as the resurrection of the dead and Jesus coming, you know, prior to the end of the age in, an, in a mysterious way. Uh, with two advents, you know, his first coming and second coming, which was something that was unexpected, perhaps among mainline Jews, but certainly uh, embedded in the in the Old Testament uh, predictions of what would happen. Uh, but also, you know, the idea of, well, if we know where we've come from and we know where we're going, then it helps it helps position us of where we're where we are now and how we ought to live. And that's why Jesus and the holy apostles oftentimes and the prophets of the Old Testament for that matter positioned the current situation in light of where we're headed and where we came from, especially where we're headed. And so understanding exactly that teleology or that direction and where we're going and the things that will happen ahead of time really prepare the church and Jesus was very clear, you know, in the first chapter of my book, I delve into, uh, I think I provide like maybe eight reasons why studying Bible prophecy is important. And not the least of which is that Christ and the apostles told us that we need to understand the things of prophecy 
and that we need to not be ignorant of where we are in the grand scheme of those things. Uh, very good. So uh, you mentioned that the number one sign that is usually overlooked, people aren't looking at 1948, a regathered nation, Israel. I believe that. I believe that everything went on pause until about 1948. And at that time, the water was turned on again and, and, and the water was pouring into the big jug. And all of a sudden, it just appears like we're at the bottleneck, like everything has been gradually going forward. And all of a sudden, here we are. And it's just it's it's accelerating to such a high degree. Uh, what are some of the signs that we should be looking at right now, along with that sign of 1948? Right. And so when you look at Ezekiel's prophecy of Gog and Magog, for example, in chapters 38 and 39, you know, he talked about how this northern coalition of nations will come in after many days in the latter years, in the latter days. And he talks about um, that these nations will come in when Israel is dwelling securely or in safety, uh, every with without walled villages, everyone feeling very secure in the land. And it also tells us in Isaiah 63, verse 18, for example, that the Jewish people will have only recently been gathered back to their land, and this after a very long period of desolation. Okay, and, and that is not what we saw prior to the destruction of the second temple. This is clearly showing us what will happen prior to the destruction of the third temple. And so I think that, um, you know, in addition to Israel returning to the land and being back, we have to have a change to the status quo on Temple Mount in Jerusalem. There has to be a great shaking because the Dome of the Rock, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, stands uh, prominently upon the top of Temple Mount and in the very place where the Orthodox Jews believe will be the necessary place for the Third Temple. And so something has to change that gridlock. Now, whether it be um, a miraculous, I mean, certainly it'll be a miraculous act of God, but whether or not it will include a military change, uh, changing of the guard, like in 1967 with um, um, Moshe Dion, I believe uh, the, um, uh, wow. when, when the, right, when the Jews recaptured the Holy Land uh, or captured Jerusalem at that time, uh, there was a change in the guard in terms of uh, ownership of the Temple Mount. But there has to be something that happens that allows the rebuilding of the temple at least to begin so that the daily sacrifice can be reinstituted. And by the middle of uh, those final years that there can be, you know, a semblance of an outer court and so forth that the prophecies predict. So we expect that gridlock on Temple Mount to change, which is by all estimates, geopolitically not possible. And so when that happens, we know for sure this is a miraculous sign of God that the time has come. Uh, and we expect that to happen very soon. We also will see an increase in the birth pains, including but not limited to uh, at least a threat of regional or international war or the threat of war at very least there has to be a imminent threat of war in order for the nations to come together and form a peace a lasting peace and security which will of course not be based on the promise not be based on the true security and peace that's found in our messiah jesus but will be based on a humanistic presumption of peace founded by the nations in their in their flesh and in their own uh aspirations which will be uh contrary in many ways to, to uh, the, the age-long peace that we'll see a few years later with Christ. But uh, So those are some of the things that we will, we will witness. Um, and my book lays out in a topical and fairly chronological fashion all of the things that will happen prior to the return of Christ, including his return, and then the things that will happen afterwards as well. So I encourage you to go through it. It's really written for, uh, for the, the layperson who loves Jesus to understand. Amen. Amen. What a great read to have. Um, do you know a, a singular place on planet Earth that is not being affected by global events around the world right now? I mean, is there anywhere in this world, except for in Christ, obviously, but doesn't it appear that the entire planet is being affected and afflicted by the events of today? The Apostle Peter, and also in the book of Hebrews, we see uh, a str some strong warnings that the things of this world will be shaken. Uh, the writer of Hebrews says that they will be shaken in such a mighty way that the things of this world will pass away so that the eternal verities of the kingdom that's coming will be revealed. And and part of that is we see like in, in, in 1 Corinthians, for example, the Apostle Paul tells us 
that uh, there will be a great burning of the things that are temporary so that those eternal things will be made manifest. And many of those will be our own deeds, the things that we think are important, the things that we establish, uh, you know, our, our trophies and our, our accolades and our, the things that, we, that man upholds as being important. Those things are going to pass away. And that's necessary so that the things that are eternal, the things that are founded in Christ, um, will be made manifest. So the, the, you know, the gold and silver will remain, so to speak, but the wood, hay, stubble, and the other things, the, the, the other, the other uh, things will, will, will certainly pass away. And so that has to happen. That great shaking has to come. And I think we're already seeing that now prior to the day of the Lord. We're already, and certainly as the great tribulation approaches, we'll see more and more things shaken until that final shaking comes at the end. Amen. Okay, well said. I wanted to ask you this. I have, I have, there are people listening right now. I have some friends that are tuned in right now. They are Jewish people. Um, they know about Jesus. They've been born again. They grew up Jewish, but really had a you know a particular thought about what that actually meant. They don't really understand the depths of their identity. Your book, Jesus, the Jews, and the End of the Age. So talk to us about the Jewish people. We live in a world that seems to be coming from what we're hearing a bit more anti-Semitic. There is something that is rivaling these Jewish people. We believe that in Christ Jesus, there is neither Jew or Gentile, but there are Jewish people in the world today. And would you give a brief description of who are these Jews that you're writing about in your book? Is it just being somebody that lives in Israel? Who are these Jews in today's world? So this is a great question, and it's one in which the Apostle Paul delves into in Romans chapters 9 through 11, primarily, and other places as well. And when you look at the whole writ of Scripture, we see that God called, um, you know, the father Abraham, our, the first patriarch of the nation of Israel, and his sons uh, Isaac and Jacob and their 12 tribes that came after them as a people who would be in covenant with him. And he made various covenants and promises with that nation, that he is in the that he is fulfilled is in the process of fulfilling and will completely fulfill uh, at the day of Christ. And so there is a process of fulfillment of these things. For example, we see this covenant that God made with David, which is the great king of Israel, and he was told that you'll have a son who will come from your own loins. And this is in Second uh, Samuel seven, uh, and he will sit on the throne, your throne, and he will build a house. A, a temple, a nation, but a house, right? A holy house. And that will continue forever. His dynasty will be everlasting. And of course, we know that Solomon, his son, came and sat on the throne, came from his own flesh, uh, ruled and reigned, but he died and his kingdom went away, at least temporarily. Uh, but we ultimately know that that scripture points to Jesus, the the Messiah, the final and and only begotten son, the anointed one of Israel, who sits on David's throne at the right hand of God and is coming back to place his throne here on terra firma, on the earth, uh, in, in, this, in this place that it will be glorified. Because God's not in the process of scrapping his original creation. He's in the process of re redeeming it and renewing it. And although there will be a great cataclysm that will burn up the things of this earth and this world, there is a continuity with that original creation, just like our bodies will be glorified and raised from the dead, there is a continuation of this body, although there will be many things that will be changed and transformed and clothed upon with glory. The same thing with the earth. There will be a continuity and a discontinuity in the new heavens and the new earth. And so there's that tension, right? Well, the same thing is true with the nation of Israel. There's a tension. And Paul talks about that. He says there's there not all Israel is Israel. So he talks about Israel according to the flesh, okay, who the, the nation, the larger uh, ethnic nation that's been given the promises and the covenants that God will do this, 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 and this through them and through their stewardship to bless all the nations, and that all those nations, according to the prophet Moses, will then be used, at least those who know and have a, a true relationship with the God of Israel, will provoke the Jewish nation back unto unto the God of Israel in the latter days after great tribulation and so forth. So we see a tension between the true Israel, which is the Israel that has been reborn from heaven, who has a new heart, who now the Gentiles also participate in those promises given to the fathers through faith in Israel's God, but that also that the children of the flesh will be brought back into that type of relationship so that Israel, according to the flesh, 
will will be a part of Israel according to the Spirit. So Paul has a tension that we have to wrestle with. It's not good enough for us to just say, well, God's blessing the Jewish nation or God is only blessing the church. No, no, no. There is a dialectic and an interplay between the Jewish nation that we see over there and, and you know throughout the nations as well with the Jewish people and with the Holy Church and the people of God and those that know Christ. So we have to understand that there's a that there is an interplay and that's not a simple theology, but it is God's theology. So we need to we need to wrestle with those things and with the scriptures so that we can have a Berean mindset and a true Christian view on on the promises of the Old Testament. All right. So when we study the book of Genesis and we see the story of Abraham, I mean, it's not a really pretty story. You have a man coming from Iraq, right? And uh, he has his wife, Sarai. His name has changed. He has relationship with God. He has a firstborn son, Ishmael, which was a mistake, uh, you know, at least in our thinking and understanding. Then he has Isaac and there's this lineal thing. Isaac marries um, you know, his wife, Rebecca, I believe it was, and they have Jacob and Esau. There's a battle going on in the womb there. Uh, Esau winds up marrying uh, or having relations with four different women to bring forth 12 sons. I mean, none of this is easy. <laughs> none of this is pretty. It's almost as though, you know, through the, uh, you know, the brokenness and the frailty of humanity, God is working out this eternal purpose and plan. Uh, which is ultimately in his son, Jesus Christ. But when did they actually become Jews? And what is a Jew to the mind that's out there today going, man, I have no idea how this works, you know, because Abraham was from Iraq. So what is a Jew? And, you know, how how do you identify one of these individuals? Yes. And so when we see, I mean, the word Jew itself came pretty late, right? It came about probably in the 6th century B.C., uh, when many of the tribes of Israel, at least Judah and Benjamin and part of the Levites and probably some stragglers as well, were taken captivity by King Nebuchadnezzar in 587, 586 into Babylon. Well, by destroying the Jewish temple, the first temple that Solomon built and taking the Jews you know, as slaves into, into Babylonia and throughout that portion of the empire, it, is, it virtually uh, threatened to wipe out Israel, the children of Israel. And by children of Israel, we mean those descendants of Jacob, who is the grandson of, of this Abraham that we that we speak of. And so not all of those Israelites, those children that are descendants of Israel, are Jews, but specifically speaking of that southern kingdom that was taken into exile by Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, they, of course, after uh, several decades, uh, after the promise of Jeremiah's 70 years, they came back to the land, or at least a, a large remnant came back to the land under Nehemiah and Ezra uh, in during the Persian period. Again, we're talking BC, okay? And they formed the nucleus of what we call the Jews, right? Which was primarily a Judean portion of Israel. Now, uh, when we when we get to the second temple period, the later second temple period with the time of Jesus and the apostles, uh, there were some from the northern kingdom that trickled back in. We see evidence of this at the end of Second Chronicles, I think chapter 30 and some other places. But the point being is that Paul and many of those in the second temple period, because they had lost, many of them had lost their tribal affiliation and identity, they were just lumped together and called Jews. So that 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 word had a broader you know, sort of field of meaning by that time. Uh, but generally, today we understand Jews in a in a cultural uh, and re- and quasi religious sense, uh, because Jews would be those who have a ethnic and national identity as a specific people, uh, of course, that we call Jews today, right? So there, there, it has changed a little bit in terms of nuance, but it's remained relatively consistent since the time of the sixth century. Okay, so for people that are, you know, looking out and uh, at Bible prophecy and they're saying, okay, we want to be looking at what's happening in the center of the world. We want to be looking at what happens to the Jews, to Israel. Um, Is it safe to say that what is happening over in Jerusalem, Israel and that area of the world that we can look at that safely? Because there are people suggesting that, you know, that is something of a counterfeit going on over there, et cetera, et cetera, that the true Jews, there's 10 million Jews in the United States of America, which is more than the people that are in Israel today, as far as Jewish people are concerned. Is it safe to say from your perspective, 
that we can safely look at what's going on in Israel today with their government, with their people, with their culture, that that is where we could be looking uh, for pinpoint accuracy of Bible prophecy. What happens there kind of has an effect upon the whole world. Is it safe to say that? The short answer is absolutely. Uh, you mentioned something earlier that really triggered not only my curiosity, but got my, uh, that I really think is, is a wonderful thing for us to talk about. And that is this issue that the story of Israel was very messy. Yeah. Right. And, so and it is, it is like our lives, very messy. Our lives are, are not, you know, we want them to be simple. We want them to be cute. We want them to be easy. We want Jesus to be in heaven with lollipops and, you know, and all this. But we know that life is not like that. Israel's story is our story. Israel's story is the story of the people of God. So there's a unique relationship between the Jewish people and the Holy Church and those that know and profess the name of Jesus. There is a unique way in which Israel illustrates the life of all men, and most particularly the people that know Christ. And and, and again, like I said, there's this, this interesting dynamic between the nations here. But um, we also see this issue of what God is doing and what he will ultimately do with this small nation of uh, originally nomads from Iraq, right? Mm -hmm. This small nation that's become a, a larger nation, but nonetheless is still relatively um, in, insignificant in terms of numeric value, right? They're a very small percentage of the world. Uh, easy to sort of dismiss glibly if if we're not in the know of what God's plans are for this people. But they really are, their eschatology, where they're headed, the things God is doing with them, is really where the apostles and where Christ derives their, their understanding of how we are saved. There is, and I, I can't get into all that with our limited amount of time, but Israel's eschatology is our soteriology. In other words, we are being saved in the manner in which Israel is. So we've got to understand their story to really understand ours. I love that. The, you know, and so we're being grafted into the root, into the tree, not uh, a separate story. I mean, it really is their story. So we have to understand their story to really understand and appreciate ours. Yeah, I absolutely love that. And as we were studying this, you know, Patricia and I have been going through the whole Bible again and reading the story. It was just amazing to me all the diversity. I mean, there's Egyptian blood uh, involved in the tribes of Israel. I mean, this is and, and just there's so many different things that happen. I wanted to ask you this question as well. Uh, going back to 1948, is there a belief system that you have that in 1948 that a particular time began to uh, start ticking away and that there is a generational um, knowledge about the beginning of a generation in 1948 that will that may come to fruition uh, throughout these years. I mean, we're, we're approaching the 80 year mark of Israel. They're going to be 75 years old a month from now, a month and a half from now. They're going to be 75 years old from 1948. Is there anything um, in between from 1948 to that extended 80 year period uh, in your thinking or theology about them as a nation? So here I would say yes and no. Okay, yes in a couple ways. Yes in the sense of God's providence. Everything is decreed by the sovereignty and providence of our Lord. He uh, loves the Jewish people. He loves the nations. He All things are planned from the beginning before the foundation of the world. He knows all things. So in, in one sense, absolutely, there's an exact time that Israel was ordained to come back to the land where Israel will experience a, a period of unprecedented tribulation, where the surviving remnant of Israel will be saved and form the nucleus of the Jewish portion of the Holy Church. There, all these things are true. Now, in terms of like calculations and what we can derive from Scripture and things like that, there may be. Um, there is some, there may be. There's a couple things. Do I think that the blossoming of the fig tree represents uh, the the establishment of Israel in 1948. I don't. I don't. I don't hold to that view for a variety of reasons that I get that I get into in my book. However, uh, we do know from Isaiah. I mentioned. I think it was what 63:18. We do know the nation would be in the land for a short time after a period of many desolations, and they'll have a temple, and that will be burned with fire and all that. So we we know that has to happen. It can't last for a long time before this. And also there, and I mentioned this in my book, and I'm not dogmatic about it, but I do mention because I think it it, it creates sort of a fullness, uh, you know, of the issues. There is a way to piece together very similar prophecies in Hosea chapter five 
and Micah's chapter 5 and uh, 6, I believe, where we see that Israel will be judged uh, for some particular reason. And it's a little bit ambiguous. One passage talks about that Israel has smitten the judge of Israel on the cheek, which I take to be a um, a symbol for the rejection of Yahweh at the cross, right? Uh, through his uh, what what took place by the nation of Israel at Calvary, uh, but also it talks about until she uh, acknowledges her guilt, and that's an interesting, curious phrase as well. But but it God of Israel speaks there in the in those passages, and he says he will go away to his place, which in the context is clearly heaven, and it says I will go again until. Until they acknowledge their guilt, which is an interesting phrase. Of course, we're all culpable for the because of our sin for the rejection of Christ. But there is a specific culpability in terms of, you know, covenantal responsibility to welcome God and His Christ into the world. That was um, was um, again, Israel represents all of us, right? So her rejection of Messiah is not specific to Israel, although it's highlighted by her covenantal responsibility uh, to receive Messiah and not having done that. But all of us have nailed Christ to the cross, so to speak, and are are guilty of his crucifixion. So I don't want to, you know, you know, suggest that only Israel is culpable for that. But specifically here in the text, Israel's being addressed, and it says that I will return again into my place until she acknowledges her guilt. And that's an interesting phrase. Uh, it talks about after two days I will bind, you know, I will tear her and devour her like a lion. But then it says after two days I will bind her up, and on the third day I will raise her. And that word "raise" is used throughout Scripture, including the New, the Septuagint and the New Testament. Uh, for resurrection. So it has sort of that resurrection motif. So something seems to happen between the second day and the third day, this pivotal, you know, very narrow period where God is going to come back. And some have speculated on the basis of such passages as Psalm 90 verse 4 and um, uh, 2 Peter 3, that that this is speaking of, you know, these millennia, you know, that the after 2,000 years, Christ will return and so forth. Now, we don't know the precise date that Christ ascended into heaven. Uh, scholars have debated this. Some say 30, some say 33. Those are the majority opinions. There's a little bit of uh, ambiguity there, which I think is probably intentional. Uh, we really don't know the day and hour of Christ's return, and we want to avoid calculations. That's gotten people in trouble for a long time. But I at least want to mention that there's a possibility that our understanding of Micah and Hosea's prophecies uh, may give us an indication that the nation of Israel needed to return at the end of the second millennium so that they could usher in the return of Christ at the beginning of the third. And so when that is exactly, we can't really calculate, but we can have an idea, especially as we see the day arriving. You know, Amen. Absolutely uh, true. So we're talking a little bit about um, just a little bit. I mean, you have a 400 page book on, on the theology, the intense insight um, that Holy Spirit has given you for people that are interested about what's going on. The end of the age. Let's get there a little bit. Um, a lot of people wonder about the end of the age. I have friends, people that I love and care about very much who are absolutely 1000 percent insistent that Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21 have already been fulfilled. Uh, the book of Revelation has already been fulfilled. I know you've already discussed this in your first book, uh, Debunking Preterism. Um, but there is a question that people have about the end of the age. Yeah, we're going to get all those books up there. Uh, there's, a, there's a question that people have, like, you're, you're an American uh, you're in the United States of America. You're seeing our nation spin out of control. It's like, you know, what is the final straw that's going to break uh, the back of this nation, the, the inevitable collapse of the United States of America? Uh, as, as a Christian, uh, what does this have to do with me? What does Bible prophecy, Ma Matthew chapter 24, have to do with me? I'm not a Jew. I'm not in Israel. I'm not going to be fleeing to the mountains of Israel. So how do I apply at a time right now, I mean, if I were really living in Israel and understood that this prophecy was for right now, I'd be looking for a home in the mountains uh, for sure. How does this work for us here in the United States and people around the world about this end time? You know, flee to the mountains when you see certain things begin to come to pass. That's the question right there that we need to answer because that's the audience relevance. You know, how is it relevant to us when we read these texts? One of the things I think that's important for us to answer that question is when we read through the New Testament, most especially, we see that the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter, Christ himself, they use 
there are certain themes that tend to rise up. It doesn't matter if they're talking about giving financially to the church, if they're talking about marriage, if it doesn't matter what subject they're talking about, they always come back to certain themes to explain why it's important that we do those things a certain way and what relevance does it have. The number one thing is the cross. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So this is the thing that we read in the, in the uh, Nicene Creed, right? Um, you know, the idea that we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and all things visible, you know, and in Christ and in the Holy Spirit. And it goes through all of what that means. And then it talks about, you know, he was crucified and suffered for us under Pontius Pilate, buried, dead. Uh, he rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures. He, he ascended on high, sits at the right hand of God, and he is coming again in glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end, and on and on and it goes. That creed is the creed of the Holy Church. That's something that we have held dear as Christians from the very beginning, um, even before it became the creed, right? We, we knew that. Why? Because the apostles and Christ himself um, used that, the that basic skeletal theology. I hate to use the word skeleton, but the rubric of that theology forms the basis for why we do all things. For example, why is whole, why is marriage holy? Why is it what what difference does it make whether or not uh, marriage is entered into a certain way? Paul tells us in Ephesians, right? Be, the mystery is Christ and the church because a husband and a wife and uniquely a husband and a wife in holy matrimony in Christ form a picture to the world and to angels and principalities of what the relationship between Christ and his holy church is. And so he goes back to this idea of Christ giving his life for, for the body, that a husband then ought to give his life for his bride, and on and on. So he uses that, that meta-narrative of Scripture, which is eschatological in nature and soteriological in nature. So it's about the end times. It's also about salvation. And he uses that as a reason for marriage, for giving, for uh, headship in the home, and on and on and on. And part of that is you know, Peter says, knowing that the world's going to be destroyed in a conflagration of fire and that we look for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness, how then ought we to live? On the basis of that, how do we live right now, right? And he says, well, let me derive some principles from that. If we know that's going to happen and the wicked are going to be judged and it's going to be awful for them, we ought to live in holiness and righteousness before God because he's coming back and he's going to judge each one according to his deeds. So always we always... Eschatology should never be this in this vacuum. It's sort of compartmentalized into this. Oh, that's interesting. I can't wait to see what happens. Doom and gloom. No, no, no. It always comes back to how then shall we now live? And 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 that is uh, something I point out many times in my book is um, is what's the relevance of this of this particular doctrine or this particular series of doctrines. And uh, so that's one of the things that I highlight is how, how then shall we now live on the basis of that here in America in the 21st century? Yeah. Do people actually look to the mountaintops to flee to? I mean, I, it's not just symbolic. The words of Jesus, I mean, are very emphatic. I mean, they're telling us exactly what to do. Their instructions are the instructions in Matthew 24 given to believers today, if in fact we're the generation in whom this prophecy is going to be fulfilled? Should we be looking to come out of her, my people? And what does that actually mean to us, especially as we see the acceleration of all these things happening before our eyes? So we can answer that by simply saying, what would it be like if we didn't have the Olivet Discourse? What, what would we be missing? What, what pieces of not just what will happen in the future, but what will we be missing about how we live now? And there are many things. For example, Jesus talks about in Matthew 25, the parable of the, of the 10 virgins, the five wise and the five foolish. Those five who had their oil in their lamps, their lamps were trimmed and ready to go so that regardless of when the bridegroom came, they were ready to go. Regardless of when the tribulation starts, regardless of when all these things take place, they were prepared now because knowing that, like it says in Luke's gospel, that those things will come on the world as a trap. So if you are not ready to go now, chances are very great that you're not going to be ready to go when the strong delusion comes and when these things come upon the earth because they're coming like a trap. And how narrowly shall people escape? Uh, but it were for the grace of God. And that's why we see so often in the book of Revelation that it says they repented not of their deeds. We only have rare instances of repentance seen in the book of Revelation. Very rare. And so that ought to be a warning to us, but also other things. He says, don't be 
taken away with the cares of this world and drunkenness and beating your fellow servants, you know, and, and, and doing the, you know, they were eating and drinking and marrying and taking in marriage until the very day that they went into the ark. Right. We see at the end of the battle of Gog and Magog at this at this final battle for humanity at the Battle of Armageddon, right in the middle of the verse about it, when all the nations are being gathered together by demons into the Middle East and all that. It tells us, behold, we hear the voice of Jesus. Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who keeps his garments and is awake. Right. So that he his shame is not exposed and his nakedness is not revealed. And I'm paraphrasing. I'm misquoting it slightly. But the point taken is right in the middle of that, at the very end, after the sixth bowl of judgment has been poured out, the world still is completely in, in oblivious to the eschatology that Christ is coming back and he's coming back as a thief. And if you are not ready, you'll miss it. And that's not just for people who live then. Clearly, it's for John's audience and it's for everybody in between. Right, this book is is timeless, and not just Revelation, not just the Olivet Discourse, but all of biblical prophecy has a timeless application for 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 God's people. Amen. It certainly does. And it, it, we talk about the end of the age. One of the greatest conversations that are being had around the world in our generation amongst Bible believing Christians mm -hmm. is the idea of well, we're not going to need to flee to a mountain in the United States of America. We're not going to need to come out of for my people. The Lord is going to secretly rapture us out of here. And I think, and I just want to preface this. I believe the first time you and I ever talked when we were on the air, you had given your testimony about a time in your life when you were supposed to be, I think you were you were uh, believing in the pre-tribulational rapture. You were believing in preterism. I forget which one you believed in. But somewhere along the line, you had an epiphany from the Holy Spirit of God. And you went against the flow of what you were expected to say, expected to talk about, expected to believe. You saw something else and you shifted. Did that have to do with the whole idea of the rapture? Because most Christians today are waiting for the secret pre-trib rapture to bring us out of this world. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, actually, that particular... If I remember the conversation correctly, I think that had to do with the preterism, right? Because I was, yes. I was, I had believed for quite a while, for like 14 years, that the Book of Revelation and the Olivet Discourse and some of those prophecies about the end times were already fulfilled. So I had bought into that that series of teachings of preterism, and had printed some, um, had received a first box of books uh, defending that. And that night, I was going to send those those books out and. Uh, I was prompted by the Lord to study the resurrection of the dead. And I thought, well, that's odd. Okay. So I went back and I read about the resurrection uh, from beginning to end in scripture. And I just went through it again. And it was like, it was like a holy hush from the spirit that said, uh, don't send these out. This is not this. So I discarded the box of books and started over. And really, uh, it was really a humbling experience, you know, because Part of what I was involved with with preterism was pride, and pride is a very dangerous thing. Um, one of the things that I talk about in chapter one of my new book is that we have to approach Christ with humility, mm -hmm. and we have to, when we read Bible prophecy and end times, we, sp we especially have to do that, because, and we have to ask God for direction, because I am convinced that the scripture is not written in a manner of a textbook or a video where we can watch it from beginning to end and go, I understand this. It's it, there is some clarity there, but there's also a, there's a lot of mystery and there's a lot of um, ambiguity and enigmas in Scripture. And the only way to navigate that minefield is to really uh, is to be led by the Spirit and to walk by the Spirit. And so that means to to obey Christ. It means to um, it means to not be proud in our own flesh because if we are chances are we're going to misunderstand Bible prophecy and we're, it's going to affect our relationship with Christ. And so humility has to be absolutely central to appropriating and understanding what God has to say about the end times, but about all kinds of other things as well. We've got to be willing to be wrong. And, you know, John the Baptist said regarding John the Baptist, the, the gospel say, uh, or John the Baptist said, uh, he must increase and I must decrease. That needs to be our heart. We need to follow the lamb wherever he goes. And that means, like Luke's gospel says, to take up our cross daily to follow him, to crucify the lusts in the flesh, to mortify those things so that the resurrected Christ can uh, be abundant in our lives and bring him glory. Well, amen to that. Hallelujah. Um, <clears throat> 
And a, another question, it just went bye-bye as I was looking at uh, what I wanted to really ask you here. Um, praise the Lord. I was looking at a screen here about what I wanted to do is open the telephone lines up to people, but there was another question. And I guess uh, that's not good that I've just forgotten the question, doctor. Oh, here it is. I got it. Here's what I was thinking. So as you were talking, I felt the spirit of God come all over me. And I think that's why I just got so disrupted in my, in my, my being here. Uh, I felt the spirit of God all over me. And I thought to myself, my God, this man, he needs to be, and I hope, because I don't know anything that you're doing, because uh, we've just kind of lost contact um, with the revelation, the wisdom, the knowledge that God has given you, the depth of teaching. We go to Sarasota all the time, and there's got to be a place called, you know, a, a gathering place of God's people where Dr. Brock Hollett is the pastor or the teacher or is, uh, you know, feeding the flock of God with this information living in the last days because so many are scattered. They're hearing bits and pieces here and there. There are levels and depths of your understanding of the word of God that, you know, I want to encourage you. And I, and I don't know, I just feel the spirit of the Lord saying, I want to encourage you that if you and your wife and your family were ever to turn the chairs around in a, in a place, an auditorium, whatever, and start teaching and, and giving that pastoral feeding of the flock of God and that prophetic teaching. Um, I would love to come visit your church one day in Sarasota, Florida, uh, Dr. Brock Hollett. And I know you're busy with a lot of uh, professional things that you're doing, but the body of Christ needs to hear this kind of teaching laid forth line upon line, precept upon precept. Um, having said that, I do want to open the telephone lines right now to anybody that's out there. I'm on the air with Dr. Brock Hollett. He's the author of several books. His latest book is Jesus, the Jews, and the End of the Age. It's a 400-page book that you could dive into, you could feed on. I know that there's people listening right now. Uh, they love this kind of material. They love to sink their teeth into deep spiritual, eschatological thinking and views and concepts and truth, and uh, they want that. So I want to encourage everybody to go to Amazon. I'm sure you can pick up the book. Is that the best place, by the way, to get your book, Dr. Brock? Yes, Amazon. Amazon's the best place. Um, I, I thoroughly recommend if you're able to spring for the hard copy, I recommend the hard copy uh, because it's laid out. The team that put it together laid it out so nicely. It's beautifully laid out. Um, I picked out the best materials I could for it. It's It's got the dust cover. Um, I just if you like something on your shelf and you're like I am kind of old fashioned, you like to read actual book books. Uh, I would I would get this one. Um However, if you're one of those people that you're like, hey, you know, I don't want to spring for, um, you know, $30 book. I just want to, you know, get it under 10 bucks and I want to read it quickly and I want to be able to read it in the middle of the night and then get the ebook because um, that's available as well in a couple different uh, options. Um, my website, uh, my author website is www.broxalter.com. Alter is like an, a church altar, A L T A R.com. So, broxalter.com. And that will have like a, a lot of the interviews. It will have all of my three books and links to Amazon. Uh, it'll also have several uh, uh, several book reviews on there for the new book. And um, so I would encourage you to go to Brock's Altar and just and look around. Also, if you want to just read five chapters of the book for free, go on to Amazon, go into the ebook, and at the top of the picture of the book, it will say, um, what's it say? It will say, look inside, click on look inside. And it literally gives you five free chapters to read. So if that whets your appetite, then the other 15 chapters uh, will, I think, uh, be a blessing to you. Okay, very, very good. And we're going to spend a little bit more time doing that before we get off the air. I'm going to the chat room right now. I want to remind everybody, this is your opportunity. If you have a question or a comment or something you'd like to share with Dr. Brock or uh, hear from him. You can call in right now. The number is 479-616-1820. 479-616-1820. I'll put that on the screen in just a moment. Autumn Nichols has a question for you. Uh, she says here, question for Dr. Hollett. What are your thoughts on the scripture? For your merchants were the great men of the earth, for by your sorcery all the nations were deceived. So great question. So I think I know where this person is going and uh, correct me online if I'm wrong, but I think uh, there's, there's lately there's been a lot of speculation about the word pharmakia in uh, this particular passage and throughout uh, Revelation and, and the whole of, of Scripture. Pharmakia is a word for 
um, sorceries, oftentimes translated sorceries, but oftentimes has at least a broader field of meaning that that implies um, psychoactive uh, drug use. OK, and so there's been questions about and I'm assuming because I'm a psychiatrist, this question is being asked. Right. Uh, because I, I, I'm, a, I'm a, a student teacher of Revelation and also a psychiatrist who prescribes, you know, psychoactive drugs and so forth. So a couple things I would say. Um, I have not made this a large uh, in-depth study personally, but my understanding of this this word is it it has the connotation of uh, sorcery. So it has the connotation of pagan practices of using psychoactive substances to alter the mind in such a manner that a person it, that it's antithetical to walking in the spirit. Okay. In much the same way that the Apostle Paul would say, do not be drunk with wine wherein is dissipation or excess, but be filled with the Spirit, right? Same thing with um, psychoactive substances, right? That's why Christians should not uh, use recreational substances, even if they seem harmless, uh, because when we use things for the sole purpose of changing our, um, our disposition, our cognition, our emotion— that can be dangerous. I mean, yes, there is a sense in which food can do those type of things or physical activity, exercise can change our emotions and so forth. But using recreational drugs, especially those that have an addictive quality, is clearly antithetical to the Christian life and faith. We do, I think, see a resurgence in recreational drug use in this country. We've seen a lot of problems with it. Uh, even Christ, you know, um, good intention Christians being caught up in the drug scene at times and sometimes costing their lives. So it's not just an issue for people outside of Christianity. It's also an issue for the church. Um, you know, I think it's important and, and I can't speak a whole lot to medicine because, you know, I'm contractually obligated to my um, line of work not to talk, but I can talk in generalities right now. Okay. I, I am not giving you medical advice. Okay. I have to ca caveat that because I'm not your doctor. Okay. And I don't have permission from the powers that be, so to speak. But what I can say is this, um, there is a time in which, uh, the abuse of pharmaceutical medicines, either by a patient or by a prescribing physician can delve into the realm of pharmacia. Absolutely. Do I believe that all psychoactive drugs are part of what is condemned in the scripture? No, absolutely not. I don't. Uh, that uh, That's kind of the broad. I hope I answered your question. And maybe that's not even what you were asking. But I think given given my familiarity with some of the um, eschatological discussions on the horizon, I think that's where you're going with it. Uh, hopefully you can, if not, comment and I'll try to get in, get, answer the question in a different way. Yeah, I would think it would just kind of, if you got to split it down the middle, you know, LSD, purple microdot, acid, heroin, cocaine, crystal methamphetamine, a lot of these drugs, including marijuana, uh, have been used in the occult for psychic ability and, and, and this kind of thing. And it is spreading all over the world. Fentanyl. Hey, by the way, being a doctor, being, going down this path right now, what the heck is fentanyl, by the way? Do you have a good a definition for yeah. what that is? Yeah, it's just a it's it's a fairly strong opioid or uh, pain medicine, right? And it's got a very highly addictive uh, quality. It can be used for medicine, but obviously, when it's not prescribed by a physician, it's being abused. Uh, it's highly dangerous, and it and even when it's prescribed, it should be kept locked up because you're talking about you're talking about the potential of harm of harm if someone gets into it accidentally. And I probably should steer clear of the medicine uh, yeah, discussion yeah. just for contractual reasons. But you know. Okay, so uh, Autumn says, thank you for that. I couldn't think of a better person to ask. So that was very complimentary. Thank you for the question, Autumn. Uh, Melissa Fletcher is asking the question. This is a pastor from South Dakota. As a psychiatrist, can you share your thoughts on the rise of mental health issues in relation to the spiritual realm of demonic oppression? Yeah, yeah. So I'll, again, I'll uh, without getting to the medicinal piece of that, I'll just say this. Um, there are different tools to understanding reality, right? We can look at things from different perspectives that are not contradictory, but complementary. And I would suggest that there are times when mental health can be uh, in relationship with the spiritual. In fact, um, cer certainly, uh, sometimes even the demonic um, we don't have, we're not privy to a lot of what goes on behind the veil, right? We're, we are not called to, um, you know, be experts on, on exorcism and oppression and temptation. We are called to be aware of the devil's wiles and be, and, and avoid them, you know, to, uh, 
to resist the devil and he will flee from us. Yes. Um, is there a relationship between mental health? Yeah, at, at times. Absolutely. 100%. Um, that's not what I do as a physician, right? As a physician, I'm treating the medical piece of it. I'm treating the psychosocial piece of it. Um, that, does that mean I don't have at times discernment of what's going on? Sometimes Spiritually, sometimes I do sense stuff. Uh, but I'm not as a physician, I'm there, not there to treat that, right? That's beyond the purview of what I'm hired to do. Uh, so I'm not going to be engaged in that while I'm at work, right? For example, uh, is there a place for, for uh, spiritual fathers in, the, in mental health? Absolutely. I think we have to be careful, though, that a spiritual father or pastor uh, does not uh, overstep their abilities, uh, that they at times recognize their limitations and say, you really need to go to a medical professional, right? So I think that that's important. Um, does God heal people instantly? Absolutely. I've seen it happen. I've had it happen in my own life where God's healed me from medical things like that. Uh, sometimes God does it that way. Sometimes God does it through through the use of physicians and so forth. Uh, God ordains the means and the ends of our healing. Sometimes we're not healed until the day of Christ. Uh, does that mean we lack faith because, you know, we have a, 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 well, no, if that were the case, there would be people who never die, right? Besides Jesus, right? Well, Jesus died. So, uh, so I guess all to say is that, um, I don't know if I even answered your question because I think I've kind of gone down a rabbit trail, but I think, <laughs> I think the short answer is yes. Mm -hmm. Spirituality and medicine intersect, uh, as a physician, I treat the med medical piece. Um, the spiritual father would treat the uh, or the pastors would treat the spiritual piece. And I think they're both important for the overall health of the individual. Amen. Amen. Okay. So we went down in some uh, deep thinking on, you know, your profession, what you do, how does, how does that work side by side with the, the understanding of the, uh, the book, the, uh, the eschatology behind the book and all that has been written. Uh, great questions. Now, most of our people are listening on rumble right now. And I want you to know if you're listening on rumble, the number is 479-616-1820, 479-616-1820. If you have a question or comment you'd like to ask online, uh, Pastor Melissa Flesher said, thank you for your thoughts on my question. So uh, very good. And, you know, interesting questions. Um, we live in a world right now, and I, I guess I want to focus on this for just a moment. Um, I, I believe it's in the, the purvey of your book. Um, we just had three nine-year-old children shot and killed in Uvalde, Texas. There were a lot more than that. Uh, we had a private Christian school that was targeted by a transgender community. Um, I think the psychosis of this, people are sitting back on, why would a young lady wanting to be a man go into a school and shoot and kill six people, three of them nine years old, not giving even life. What is the psychosis behind that? What is the mentality behind that? It seems very demonic. Obviously, it's very demonic in our understanding of things. Um, America's in turmoil right now. Our nation is in turmoil. We have the president of the United States being indicted, and we're waiting to see what that indictment is. And they're wondering, you know, this is the first time, and that is a consternation of possible more rioting, revolution, civil war, a lot of bad things. You have a transgender weekend coming up of vengeance, a day of vengeance. Today is the new holiday given by uh, this man that they call the president, uh, Joe Biden. Uh, there, there's, there's a consternation. There's an anxiety. There's a, the depth and a weight and a substance of a feeling uh, that is rising within our nation, and I would suspect around the world too. Um, how do you bring this all into view right now from your perspective, lining up with end-time Bible prophecy? Does America, Dr. Brock, have anything to do with end-time Bible prophecy from your standpoint? Well, you know, Jesus said that the love of many will grow cold. And he talks about, you know, you will see nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Um, and because uh, lawlessness will prevail. In other words, people doing what they want to do, even if it causes violence and other things to other people, because those things will increase, Jesus says, the love of many will grow cold. So the short answer is, although we can, you know, assess why these type of things happen from, I mean, it's, it's multifactorial, right? We could di digest it and dissect it in many, many different ways. And I think all those are important. I'll leave those for, um, you know, for another day. But I think that I think that the general gist is that we lack love. 
And I think that's um, part of ancestral sin that we lack love. It's part of what's ubiquitous with humanity. But, you know, without waxing, you know, sentimental and going down into a John Denver song or something, I think that truly we need more love. We need more love. And Jesus is love incarnate. He is what love is. And so if we grow close to him and we learn of him and sit at his feet and the Holy Spirit of God uh, enlivens our hearts and sanctifies us, we're going to love. And so Jesus is, is encouraging us in the Olivet Discourse that we love one another, right? And that's why in John's gospel and in the epistles, love is that central theme. So I think the short answer without glibly dismissing something that's um, multifactorial and has a lot of moving parts, uh, if we could summarize it down to one thing, it's like Jesus said, you know, which what's the greatest commandment? Hero Israel, the Lord our God is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength. And the second's just basically an extension of it. Love your neighbors yourself. That's what the world needs, and that's what's going on in places uh, where, all, where we're seeing so much violence and so much hatred. Amen. All right, so you're looking at the screen right now. For those of you who are uh, a new book by Dr. Brock Hollett, there is the hardcover, Jesus, the Jews, and the End of the Age. Um, this gentleman has put a lot of labor, energy, work, Holy Spirit, uh, along with raising a family, being a husband, doing all the things that you do. Uh, Dr. Brock, I want to just say thank you for the hard labor of love in writing the book. Thank you that you are living in a very challenging uh, moment from the spiritual things that are becoming so much more spiritual. And, uh, you know, the things that you're involved in, the medical field, there's been so much uh, conversation. We haven't even talked about some of the things you get deplatformed for, like, uh, you know, what happened in COVID-19? We didn't talk since that whole time. Uh, is there any perspective that you have on that that you would want to share at this time or no? Well, I just I, I just think that when we see sickness becoming rampant in such a way and we see the way that we have handled or mishandled, you know, um, you know, crises like that, I think it's just, you know, it's all part of the general signs of the times. It's part of the birthing process. Jesus said that the birth pains would increase. You know, we read in Revelation, we see plagues. We see people dying. We see some horrific things on the horizon. And so, and of course, some of this is nothing new. Jesus said, you know, the apostles were already seeing many of these signs. He, he just said, this is, don't get too excited at this point. He said, these are just the beginnings of the birth pains. In other words, birth pains get more intense and they increase, especially right before a child is born. And so we should expect an intensity and, uh, you know, so so this is nothing new under the sun, but we will expect an intensity uh, that will reach a climactic moment, uh, denouement, a, a fullness right before the return of Christ. And uh, Christ, of course, will put an end to sickness and death and pain and sorrow. And uh, that's accessible to us now in Christ. Amen. And that's the day we are all looking for. And um, we we've it's it's messy. It's a mess. But he takes our mess. He turns it into a message. And That's books right. like yours and writings like yours, Dr. Brock, are going to help people, you know, continue to advance, grow, ascend into what God has called them to. Is there anything else on your heart personally that you'd like to share with our listeners today? Not that I can think of. Just, uh, you know, thank you for the opportunity to share uh, Christ and the good news with you, to, to share the things about eschatology that God's given me uh, that I think will be a great blessing for all that profess Christ's name and a uh, uh, of course, thank you as well, Pastor, for having me. Absolutely. All right. The book is on the screen, a new book by Dr. Brock Hollett, Jesus, the Jews, and the End of the Age. I highly recommend everybody get a copy. I'm certainly going to go online. We're going to get a copy of the book. And it's been a wonderful hour and a few minutes with you, Dr. Brock. Thanks for joining us on the air. And thanks for being on The Watchman. God bless thank you. you. All right, my friend. All right, there it is. A new book by Dr. Brock D. Hollett, Jesus, the Jews, and the End of the Age. And I uh, want to highly recommend, get a copy of the book. This man, I'll re I remember uh, interviewing him on Kerm Radio, which is an AM FM radio station here in Northwest Arkansas. And uh, I, I sat there absolutely awed by the depth of understanding and revelation. Now, I'm uh, we had a one-hour discussion, and I can't imagine the insight, the thought that has been written. Uh, my tongue, David said, is the pen of a ready writer, a skillful writer. And I think there's a skill 
here in Dr. Brock Hollett in his writing about the end times, about the Jews, about the end of the age, and all about Jesus. So I encourage you to get a copy. It is Friday. I want to thank everybody for tuning into the broadcast. It's been a great week. We look forward to seeing everybody on Tuesday, Lord willing, and that will be the day before the beginning of the Feast of Passover. So we want you to have a great weekend right here in Northwest Arkansas. Tomorrow, uh, Miss Bonnie Boyer is going to be sharing at the Women of Substance and Uwine Ministries, if you happen to be listening, and you're in Northwest Arkansas tomorrow, 2 p.m. at the New Wine Ministry Gathering Place in Bella Vista. You could come and be a part of that woman's meeting. She's going to give a dynamic testimony. So don't forget that Saturday, 2 p.m. Uh, we have a men's meeting coming up Sunday, 9 a.m. on the Ark for any man that's out there listening right now that wants to get around. Ooh, we the men. We're going to have a great time. That was uh, my, a stretch of Arnold Schwarzenegger. I don't think it worked very well. Um, and also, I wanted to remind you that, what did I want to remind you about? I wanted to remind you it's Friday. It's Paul Jack's birthday. I wanted to say to my dear friend, Paul, happy birthday to you, sir. I hope you're tuned in and listening right now. Paul, you were in a hospital not too long ago, a little over a year ago, and you were at death's door. And God raised you up miraculously out of that hospital in Savannah, Georgia, and he brought you into Northwest Arkansas. You are now being utilized by the Lord to open doors, to pave ways. Uh, God has done amazing things in your life. There's a testimony that you have. And we just want to say from Patricia and I and all the New Wine Ministry family, happy birthday. We love you very, very much. And we ask the Lord to continually guide you, direct you, bless you, and uh, use you as a bulldozer to open pathways that have been closed so that others may go through. God bless you. God bless your generous heart, and God bless your birthday today and throughout the year. May God use it for his glory. Um, all right, so that's another thing that was most important to me on my list. And then please remember, you could get our app. You could download it. The app is at uh, on your phone. You just download My Church app, PushPay. My Church app, PushPay. And that is right here. I'll put it on the screen for those watching My Church app. Push pay, and that will bring you to a place where they're going to want you to type in a keyword. And all you do after downloading the app, it's the blue one with the white cross on it. Uh, that is my church app, Push Pay. And then when you download it, you get it. They're going to ask you for a keyword. You're going to type in NWMAPP, and we'd like you to get that app downloaded and then go on and explore everything that we're doing there. So with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, again, a new book by Dr. Brock D. Hollett. Maybe this weekend you should get a copy of it, get it, and uh, let's get into some educated thinking and informative thinking and biblical insights to a great conversation, which is the times that we're living in right now. It's swirling all around us. Jesus, the Jews, and the end of the age. Bless uh, this author. Bless this Dr. Brock Hollett by getting a copy of his book. I hope you do. As I said, we're going to do it. And until we meet again, this is Pastor Vincent Xavier. It's been an honor to be with all of you. It's been an incredible week. We started the week with Pastor Melissa Fletcher and then Pastor Jeff Bass out of Jacksonville, Florida, and Brian and Kathy Gray, our missionaries living in Tennessee, and Dr. Brock Holla today. We will begin the week next week with Brother Don Huddle. He's going to talk to us about the war going on in Russia, Ukraine, and this kind of military uh, movement that's happening in our world today. And we're going to just shift our schedule a little bit next week. And we always want to accommodate people that are doing great things in the kingdom of God. Stay the course. Know that God loves you. Jesus Christ died for you. And uh, we like the Jews, as was said, it started messy. There's nothing normal about how we began this journey. And in humility, we receive that beautiful sacrifice. And uh, just remember, start preparing. It's a great time of the year. Start preparing for intimacy with Christ. We'll see you on the broadcast next week. We'll see you Tuesday. Shalom. God bless everybody. Have